even though it may seem quite simple, it's something that's just been annoying and hard for our community for a very long time and has quite an impact on the quality of life. I also want to share with you all that some people say that they have concerns about if there's sports on the TV and what if the captions would block the scores. And I want to share with everyone that that is something that used to happen in the past, but captions have gotten so much better and that is no longer the case. There's just so many ways that this bill impacts our community. And all we have to do is simply turn the captions on. So I ask all of you to support Senate File 2044. Thank you all for your time and for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Ling. Do any members of the committee have any questions for either of the testifiers? Senator Lima. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Abler, uh, have you heard any any uh, direction or response from the business community in Minnesota regarding your legislation? Senator Abler. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Senator Limmer, uh, only from Hospitality Minnesota, and their concern was actually about the, uh, if you're not listening to the sound, could they leave the sound off? But it um, and their concern was literally for the scores at you know sports bars and so on. But it it seems like that is uh, able to be moved around. Not that I would know how to do that, um, but I that, that was their concern. They're not testifying today, but that's the sum of what I've heard altogether. Is there any other member of the public uh, that wants to come forward and testify in connection with this bill? I'm not seeing anyone. Any discussion among members of the committee? Senator Limmer. Uh, Senator Abler, is there a cost to this, either to the state or to individual businesses that are required to install this type of programming? Senator Abler. Thanks, Senator Lance. And uh, we're going to state government, so we're going to look into that as a, as a as a secondary privilege, this bill is going to be, this is its primary privilege that's coming today. Um, and maybe that my testifiers might know, but uh, most of this is as simple as turning on a button. Uh, the, the Hospitality of Minnesota people, it was just a matter of, is it going to affect their um, sports or not? And I, I think there's a way to accommodate that. Um, so if my, there is some, one of my testifiers would like to comment about that, Mr. Chair. Ms. Lane. Yes, thank you, Senator. Uh, this is Alicia speaking. There is no cost associated with this. Um, this also is in accordance with Minnesota human rights law. It's, this, is, this would not be um, something that is penalized. Uh, businesses would not be penalized. But this is something that just makes our voices a little bit louder. So if you all pass this, our community is in process of educating the community in general and businesses. Um, any kind of establishments, if they don't have their, their captions on and they, were, they refuse to turn them on, then they can file something with the Minnesota Human Rights Department. And in turn, many of us have tried to just gently ask to have them turn the captions on. Myself, personally, I have experienced this. Ironically, I have been at a restaurant that is right next to a deaf school, and the staff regu are regulars or regularly um, attend that bar after work, and I have asked if they could turn it on, and they say, yes, let me work on it, oh, let me try, and I was there again a month later, and captions were still not on. And so this is something that we've dealt with for a while. And this can be make TV and what's going on in the establishments accessible to all. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Uh, Senator Abel, maybe this would be better for your testifiers. Maybe they can help me. But... Um, is it a matter of simply turning on a switch um, to uh, activate the closed captioning um, 
And if so, does that apply to any channel, any kind of programming that there is, or are there some programs that simply it's just not available, and then how would this bill deal with those situations? Ms. Lynn. This is Alicia. I'm happy to answer that question, Senator. So since the 1990s, all TVs above 13 inches automatically include the technology to add captions. Mm -hmm. And that's been the law, like I said, for decades. Now, what you're asking about is the content itself and if it is captions, if it is captioned. Because the content has to be captioned to be able to show on the screen. So 100% of the programming should be captioned by law. However, commercials are still optional. I promise you there will be no complaints about someone not being able to access the information in commercials. And even if they do, the FCC has a separate process for that. What this is about is just operating the equipment. So turning on the technology that's in the equipment on the TVs. As you're saying, turn the switch, turn the captions on, that's it. Nothing additional. Any further discussion from members of the committee? Is there a motion? Senator Limmer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move the Senate file 2044 be recommended to pass. I don't know the direction. State, state, state government. government. State government. To the state government committee. Senator Limmer moves that Senate file 2044 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Senate Committee on State and Local Government. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Abla. All right, Senator Kupik. House File 62. Senator Kupik, go ahead when you're ready. Describe your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm here with uh, House File 62, Senate File 303. Uh, it is uh, funding for the Public Employee Relations Board, also known as uh, the PERB. So the uh, board was created back in 2014, uh, and it was set up with $125,000, which uh, I understand was what was supposed to be for the setup. And then it was never properly funded after that. So as a consequence, uh, the MMB did not allow them to hire any full-time staff uh, for a one year. Uh, they did eventually save up enough money that the PERB uh, did function for one year. And in that time frame, uh, the Public Employees Relation Board heard 31 cases. Uh, two filed by individuals, 29 by unions. Uh, they issued complaints in 10, uh, three of which went to hearing, seven were settled, and the remainder of the cases were withdrawn, dismissed, or deferred to arbitration. So the Public Employee uh, Relations Board kind of functions much like the National uh, Labor Relations Board, and it is a way to save local m communities uh, money so they do not have to pay court expenses. It is taken to the board and then uh, filed there. So it is a cost savings for the state, local government, and also for any employees that might also be bringing a suit. So without a fully funded agency, workers and unions throughout the state have had no option but again to engage in costly litigation. So we're here uh, to, with a review quest to reinstate uh, funding for the PERB. And I brought with me uh, testifier Meg Luger. She's the current chair of the Public Employee Relations Board. Ms. Luger, welcome to the committee. Please go ahead and state your name and affiliation for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Latz and members of the committee. My name is Meg Luger-Nikolai, and I'm the current chair and union representative on the PERB. 
And I am here to speak in favor of House File 62 and Senate File 303 and to thank Senator Kupik for carrying it. We are really hoping that at this point in the adolescence of the PERB, we can actually get the funding that we need to operate. So as Senator Kupik said, we did operate briefly and we were in the second half of a biennium and so we used two years worth of allotment to try to get us through. But we are at a juncture where we are unable to hire any full-time staff and it is pretty hard to recruit anyone for an executive director or attorney position at a point three. So we are grateful for the opportunity to have funding that enables us to, to actually staff the board up. We've been very fortunate to work with some excellent folks who are willing to give of their retirement, but we are hoping for a more um, long-term solution. The portions of this bill that are within the committee of this, or within the jurisdiction of this committee, relate to changes to the Open Meeting Law and the Data Practices Act. First of all, currently the board doesn't have any ability to deliberate in a non-public fashion, and so we are asking for a change to the open meeting law to enable us to deliberate like other boards. So like other licensing boards, like other judiciary, other judicial entities, we have both an investigative function and a deliberative function, and we just like to be able to do our deliberations in the same way that other boards do. Secondly, it makes a minor change to the Data Practices Act, which enables us to retain the classification of data in our hands as it is maintained in the hands of an employer. So again, our investigative function requires that we collect information about a charge and then determine whether or not it has merit. And sometimes that includes collecting information that in includes non-public data about an employee or potentially about the functions of a, of a public employer. And so we want to be able to be in the same position of that employer. On the other hand, the data, as you can see from the language of the bill, it makes a great deal of information about a charge and about a complaint if one is ever issued um, public. So, you know, the, most of the, the meat of the charge is public and a complaint, portions of the complaint, or the whole complaint would always be public. And so we are trying not to obviously hide the ball in any way. This data was workshopped with our colleagues in the, the public data community. We believe that we reached rapprochement and we reached a solution that we think meets everyone's needs. So we are comfortable with this language and we hope that the committee will as well. So we really appreciate the opportunity to address the committee today. Thank you, Ms. Luger. Anyone else in the room here wish to testify in connection with this, uh, uh, this bill? Not seeing anyone coming forward. Any questions from members of the committee or discussion? Senator Limmer. Uh, Ms. Luger, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you mentioned you spoke to people in the public data community. Could you tell me who they were? Mr. Chair, Rep uh, Senator Limmer, my goodness, Senator Limmer. Ms. Luger. We spoke with um, Mr. Newmeister, who is typically an, an important advocate for these issues, and we also spoke with folks at MinCoGi and actually workshopped a language with them. And that's the Minnesota Council on Government Information. And Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer. Uh, Ms. Luger, uh, usually... Uh, when we have bills like this, uh, the other party who would who would be, be the other who would be the parties in a dispute, typically. Ms. Luger. Chair Latz, Senator Limmer, the parties in a dispute that the PERB would oversee would include individuals who had a claim against their union, individuals who might have a claim against their employer, and then most most commonly unions and public employers. And Mr. Chair, Senator Lummer. Uh, knowing that, uh, have you gotten a buy-in from unions and the business community regarding this bill? Ms. Luger. Chair Latz, Senator Limmer, I'm going to be completely candid with you and say that we have not consulted anybody in the private sector business community because this law excludes them under its coverage. They're not covered at all. However, we did, we have um, talked about this with our colleagues at the League of Minnesota Cities. They had offered some changes for the language and so that some of their, their changes is, are reflected in this language as well. Mr. Chairman, I, Senator Limmer. I uh, <laughs> noticed that the bill was introduced way back January 5th. So it was in the first week of the legislative session when it was introduced, and if there was any interest uh, by anyone else, they certainly had time and hopefully the energy to, uh, to uh, have discussion with the sponsor and the chief author. So I have nothing more to say, Mr. Chair. It's a clear one. Mr. Chair, um, I move that... Um, 
Where is the House file 62? Um, be recommended to pass and refer to the Finance Committee. Senator Umu Verbaten moves that House File 62 be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Senate Committee on Finance. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Luger Chair, and Senator you. Kupik. You're on to finance. Okay, we're going to move around a little bit on the agenda as we are assessing availability of authors and testifiers. So, so don't who's next? Not in, so we'll do a crewing, Senator Cruen, you can select from among your three bills on the agenda today. Which one would you like to hear first? Senate File 1934, Senator Cruen. Senator Kroon, go ahead and describe your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Um, the uh, purpose of this bill is to define the term stay in Minnesota statutes 609.14, which is the uh, re revocation of stay statute, uh, to include stays of adjudication, imposition, and execution. Under a uh, 2021 Court of Appeals decision, uh, State versus Solian, uh, the court interpreted uh, Minnesota Statute 609.14 to only apply to stays of imposition and execution and not stays of adjudication. Uh, this bill will uh, bring stays of adjudication into the revocation of stay statute and make it clear that the court does not lose subject matter jurisdiction to revoke the stay as long as the violation occurs during the stay and the summons is issued within six months after the expiration of the stay. Uh, with me to testify in favor of this bill is Brian Lindbergh. He's the uh, criminal division chief at the Anoka County Attorney's Office. Um, also, I believe Carly Stock with the Association of Minnesota Counties is here to testify. Um, and I also have in the audience Dylan Warkington, Director of Corrections in Anoka County uh, to answer any questions. And I would also note a letter from the Minnesota County Attorneys Association in the packet uh, in favor of this bill. And with that, Mr. Chair, I would like to turn it over to my testifier, Mr. Lindbergh. Thank you, Senator Kroon. Mr. Lindbergh, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, Chair Latch, members of the committee, thank you very much. Uh, we're looking to amend uh, 609.14 to include stays of adjudication of sentence Currently under Minnesota law, there are three basic ways to be placed on probation. Number one is a stay of ex execution of sentence. Number two is a stay of imposition of sentence. And number three is a stay of adjudication. Both the stay of execution and stay of imposition are currently included in 609.14. Under that particular statute, the court can revoke your probation even after that probation has expired under the provisions that the probation officer finds out within six months after your expiration, you violate your probation, you can still come into court. And once those court proceedings are initiated, you're still on probation until they're done. Under the Court of Appeals decision, they have held that under a stay of adjudication, you must bring that violation before probation expires. And even if you do bring that violation within that uh, probationary period, if the disposition does not occur prior to uh, the, ex the expiration of your probation, you're discharged from probation and the court cannot proceed with the probationary rev revocation proceedings. What we're looking to do is bring a stay of adjudication disposition into compliance with both the stay of execution and the stay of imposition of sentence. Thank you, Mr. Lindbergh. Ms. Stark, did you want to testify on this matter? Yes, hello, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, I am Carly Stark, and today I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Association of Community Corrections Act Counties. Um, we support this bill because it 
creates the same treatment under the law of all types of stays. And we think it will help ensure that prosecutors continue to use stays of adjudication because it gives clients an opportunity to participate with programming and decreases collateral consequences for those that successfully complete probation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stark. I also have on my testifier list Dylan Warkenton. Is Mr. Warkenton here? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Kroon. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you want, had anything to add or if you just wanted to stand for questions. Um, just a, Mr. Warkenton. Um, Senator Latz, thank you for the opportunity, members of the committee. My name is Dylan Workington, uh, Director of Community Corrections. Just a couple of things regarding collateral consequences. Um, so um, we recommend probation lengths um, under stays of adjudication, stays of imposition, and stays of execution as a department like all of the departments in the state of Minnesota. The fix for this without a legislative fix is actually to increase probation lengths. Um, in order to ensure that time exists. And so we don't want to do that. Actually, we would prefer stays of adjudication and other deferred types of prosecution have short lengths of supervision, give people opportunities to be successful, and then move them through the system and uh, do that quickly. So uh, part of the issue here really got highlighted during COVID-19 where cases were set for revocation, many of them stays of adjudication, and then needed to be continued for a variety of different reasons. And so this just pr preserves due process in large part and gives opportunity and more time to do that without other collateral consequences uh, occurring. So thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Warkington. Um, Senator Kroon, was there anyone else that uh, you anticipated to testify here today? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. I see Nate Reitz standing up, but before I made the call to the Others in the room, Mr. Reitz, come on forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Nate Reitz. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. The Commission has no position on this bill, uh, either for or against. Uh, the staff of the Commission is concerned not about the policy behind the bill, but in terms of its implementation. Specifically, we're concerned about uh, the way 69.14 will look after this bill is enacted. In subdivision one, there's reference to stays of imposition and stays of execution, and, and, and that those are what is contemplated being revoked. There's nothing about stays of adjudication in subdivision one. In subdivision two, there's also a reference to uh, stays of imposition, stays of execution, nothing about stays of adjudication. Our, our biggest concern, though, is subdivision three, which gives the judge essentially two options on, on how to proceed if there's going to be revocation. One is for stays of imposition, one is for stays of execution. There's nothing about stays of adjudication. So there has to be an option there for stays of adjudication if stays of adjudication are going to be under 609.14. So we did provide Senate counsel with some possible language to, um, to fix this. I will say from a, a sentencing guidelines staff perspective, uh, we do see some issues with uh, revoked stays of adjudication where judges do not know that they are required at that point to follow the sentencing guidelines because that's the first time the defendant will have been convicted and sentenced. And uh, we see this bill without these conforming amendments as only perpetuating that confusion. Uh, so so we, would, we, we would just ask that, that the remainder of the section be conformed to the policy that's, that's being contemplated in this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wrights. Um, does council have uh, any language that's ready for us to consider, or if not, might it be ready by the end of our hearing? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, um, I, I, we do have uh, an amendment prepared to address these concerns. Um, I, I think that the way that the bill is drafted for the definition section would make it clear that stay of adjudication is covered throughout in those situations. But I will uh, introduce the A1 amendment for the uh, uh, committee's consideration. And if the committee thinks that this is a better way of drafting it, I don't think we would have a particular issue with that. Thank you, Senator Kroon. Uh, the uh, amendment will be distributed to members and uh, provided electronically to those joining us on a hybrid uh, hearing.
Mr. Wright, have, have you seen this amendment, the A1 amendment? I uh, will get you a copy. I'd like you to tell us if, in your judgment, this meets the concerns raised by the Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Mr. Chair, the amendment does address the concerns I identified. Thank you, Mr. Reitz. <clears throat> well, I, for one, Senator Kroon, would be more comfortable adopting the A-1 amendment uh, to provide what any necessary clarification for reviewing courts. Obviously, courts sometimes review these questions. That's why we're before the committee today. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would accept the A1. As a, I, I know it's not an author's amendment because it didn't come at the beginning, but I'd accept it as a friendly amendment. Well, Senator Kroon, it is still your first stop, oh. and it's okay. the first amendment offered on the bill, so I think it still qualifies as an author's no, amendment. No, no, author's amendment it is, then, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, then uh, Senator Kroon moves adoption of the A1 amendment as an author's amendment. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Any further discussion on Senate File 1934? Not seeing any. So, members, uh, what we're going to do. Uh, because we just want to make sure fiscal has a chance to take a look and make sure the amendment doesn't change anything in relation to that. Uh, we're going to lay it over. Um, if there is no fiscal impact, uh, we can move it on independently or make it part of a, a smaller judiciary omnibus bill. Otherwise, uh, it might become part of the finance bill. Uh, but uh, thank you all for your testimony. At this time, Senate File 1934 is laid over. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Like me to stay up here? Or uh, actually, Senator on? Dornink has arrived, and right. since it's our practice to try to accommodate members' bills who are not on the committee, uh, we'll uh, do that. We'll move to Senate File 201, Senator Dornink. Uh, members' Thank you, Mr. copies Chair. of the uh, Senate file are being distributed uh, to the committee. Senator Dornick, tell us about your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. This is a pilot program for alternatives to incarceration. Uh, and I believe I have Mayor King online to testify to this bill. So I'd like to turn over to Mayor King. Mayor King, welcome to the Senate Judiciary Committee. If you could go ahead and unmute yourself um, and then uh, state your name for the record and tell us what you'd like to say. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And thank you, Gene, uh, Senator Dornick, for having me on. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. My name is Steve King. I am the director of Moore County Corrections in Austin, Minnesota. That's the capacity I'm, I'm before you with today uh, to discuss uh, the, the, what will be very positive to, to be able to get the alternative incarceration funding for Moore County Corrections. Uh, Mayor King, can you give us a little bit of a description of what the uh, funds would be used for? Sure. You know, there, there's in, in corrections, we, we throw around the terms of risk and need uh, pretty loosely and, and for, for a lot of good reasons. We should be concerned about both our offenders risk to the community and our offenders needs. But what I fear is getting lost in the uh, whether it's low funding or other issues is we're only paying attention to the high risk offenders uh, as those w that are going to be harmful to the public. Uh, certainly, we gotta, we're not going to forget about them, but what's also uh, grouped into a lot of folks on probation is those that are just a very high need. And these are the people that are addicts. Uh, these are folks with mental illness. And generally speaking, they're not a, a risk to anybody but themselves. Uh, down here in Moore County, I don't want to forget about the people. These folks need absolutely as many resources as the folks that we're concerned about for high risk. And they all absolutely are taking just as much uh, time away from law enforcement or time into law enforcement or probation departments 
And so what the, the last thing we want to do is incarcerate these folks that are not a danger to the public, but we use our jail here in Moore County in, in the, the shop I work with in Moore County Corrections. A lot of our jail time is used to protect the, the offender from themselves. They are coming to us with a, with a significant fentanyl uh, addiction. And in a lot of cases, if we don't incarcerate them, they will die. Uh, we're, we're having a, a very large increase in our, in our uh, overdose deaths. And so we're using these not for punitive reasons, but for, for reasons to help the offender. Again, very high need, very low risk to the community. But what I see using this funding for is to break down the barriers, to remove the barriers of transportation costs, to get methadone, to put them on electronic monitoring rather than house them in a the jail. These are costly. You know, Transportation is certainly a, a barrier and it has a cost. Uh, the treatment aspect, a lot of times when you're in the system, it, you, have, you don't have private insurance and that comes through uh, going to treatment through whatever, what's the rule, rule 20, uh, rule 20 or 25, I mean, rule 25. And that takes time and it's precious time. What I use this, would use this money for is immediately getting folks assessed by some of our, uh, our vendors that do chemical dependency assessments and mental health assessments and get them to the treatment place they need uh, while doing the, the other paperwork to get some county funding at the, at a different time. But the, the expediency with which, with, with which these people need attention is right now. And whatever is lacking in their uh, environment to provide these supports and get them where they need to be rather than incarcerated in a jail, uh, I want to provide for them. So again, transportation costs, gas vouchers, housing, we want to catch these folks before they're in absolute crisis. And we can see it as probation departments. We can see our folks that are heading right to crisis and there's really no intervention that we can do uh, that heads it off. And so you're just waiting on that final leg to shoot a drop and all of a sudden it's incarceration for the wrong reason. Maybe they did uh, harm somebody uh, or get behind the wheel with their addiction and, and create that public safety risk. So that's what I envision is just to, to break down the barriers, remove the barriers, barriers for these people that really need attention outside of the uh, jail facility and really they just don't have the funds uh, or the, the means. Take their hand, uh, get them where they need to be and, and so everybody wins on that. So, Mr. King, the bill is, uh, or the section is captioned uh, alternatives to incarceration pilot program, but then it makes yep. reference in the body of the bill to the uh, program that's already in statute, section 244.32. So, can you tell me two things? One, how is uh, what you're proposing here a pilot program? And secondly, um, if you're already doing some of this, uh, where is the funding com coming from for the existing well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally, in the probation offices I've worked for, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I personally have given away bikes, clothes, uh, taken folks to methadone uh, off the clock, uh, just as much as any of the probation officers that work with me. So, yes, we are providing uh, some of this service, not by any time, any way, maximizing what we could do. But what we're really here for is, you know, I think there's uh, counties like Wright, uh, I believe Anoka and Crow Wing have this, have this in place. And I think the overarching reason why we're here is, uh, I'm sure it's not lost on you folks, that Minnesota is the lowest funded uh, state for corrections. And so that lack of funding just takes, uh, puts the offender into the pockets of those that really do care in the probation departments like us in a, in a smaller rural community uh, of 38,000 population in the county. We're taking it upon ourselves to, to fund this uh, aspect of whatever that barrier might be. Um, so that's what we are doing, but I know we could do a lot more to maximize. So the uh, the program already exists in your county and it's being funded by the county, um, but you're no, seeking, no. no? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. No, the, the, the program does Mr. not Chair. exist in Moore County. Okay, so it, for <laughs> Moore County, this would be a pilot program, um, but it exists it be, in a few other counties in Minnesota already. Correct. All right, uh, Mr. Turner is going to help us out with this a little bit. Mr. Turner. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members. Uh, the Department of Corrections budget has a base appropriation of $320,000 each year, and that goes towards funding the alternatives to incarceration programs in Anoka, Crow Wing, and Wright. Uh, the legislature set up this as a pilot in, I believe, Anoka first. And then two years ago, I believe we added Crow Wing County to that. 
but right now there's three counties that are part of this program and this is Maurer um, applying to become the fourth county. All right, and is there any particular uh, funding amount that's uh, requested for the, the, the Moore County efforts? Mr. Chairman, the, the bill has a blank appropriation. I was hoping maybe we could get some idea. I, the others are averaging about $100,000 a year. So if, if it were the committee's desire to move forward with uh, establishing the program in this county, um, we would need to, what would we need to do? I mean, is, is the language in this bill the right way to do it, or would we add to an already existing statute or program that identifies the other three counties and then increase the funding to reflect that? Or what would be the best route here, Mr. Turner? Mr. Chairman, members, um, I believe the rider or you know this would become a rider in the budget bill is is adequate okay. the one thing um, the committee would have to decide or you would have to decide is you know how much per year to give to Maurer and I was wondering if perhaps the testifier or the author could give us some idea of what we would what you would write into that blank appropriation Senator Dornick, Mr. Mr. Chair, King. it's a appropriation for 24 and 25, and we left it blank purposely because we didn't know exactly how it was going to work. So I don't know if the uh, mayor has a specific number that he has in mind. I was thinking, well, I'll just let him answer the question. Mayor King. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members. Uh, what, right, what we have right now in Moore County, and I'm pretty convinced we're the only county that has a uh, has an expense line for, for, for uh, electronic monitoring. That's about $52,000 a year that Moore County expends to get folks that can't afford electronic monitoring onto electronic alcohol monitoring or a SCRAM unit or something that is transdermal to detect the drug and alcohol use. So that would be a number that I would say we could probably live with in that fifty to $60,000 range for our, for our community that would offset what the county right now is paying to really keep folks uh, away from the jail, but also a little bit of a uh, cushion here we'd use uh, certainly to get them into treatment and, and, and help offset those costs as well. So in that $60,000 range, I'd, I'd be say it would be a safe number for Moore County. Senator Dorn. Mr. Ch I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, so is that per year, Mayor, or is that for two years? Mayor King. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members and Gene, um, Senator Dornick, that would be for uh, each year, 60,000 would be, would be appropriate, I would think, for each year. Okay, okay any uh, members of the committee have any questions or discussion? Anyone in the room wish to testify in connection with the bill? All right, then, uh, Senator Dornick, we're going to lay over Senate File 201 for possible inclusion in our budget bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank members. you for your testimony here today. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. I see Senator Weber is here in the room. Senator Weber, would you like to come forward for Senate File 472, please? He has some online testifiers. And we have a couple of online testifiers joining us as well. Why don't you go ahead and introduce the bill? Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the hearing for Senate File 472. <clears throat> Our uh, local and tribal governments in Minnesota uh, have for some time needed additional resources to enhance the emergency management capabilities and planning uh, for their respective communities. Uh, the lack of this has, has created issues, and particularly when we have seen more emergencies uh, evolving in these recent years. And so this proposal appropriates $3 million a year in state funds to the 87 counties, 11 tribal governments, and four cities of the first class with the money to be uh, split equally uh, to each of those entities. And uh, with me today, I have uh, uh, online, we have uh, John Bowen and Kyle Oldry uh, from um, uh, two different counties, and I have Gary Johansson with me, who would like to address this issue further, Mr. Chair. All right. Senator Weber, do you have a preference what order we go in for your witnesses? We'll start out with Mr. Johansson. Yep. All right. 
Mr. Johansson, welcome to the Senate Judiciary Committee. If you'd go ahead first, state your name and your affiliation for the record, and then proceed. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, Chair Latz and committee members. My name is Gary Johansson. I am Norman County's Emergency Manager. I'm also past president of AMEM, which is Association of Minnesota Emergency Managers, and current Government Affairs Committee member. Uh, and again, thank you, Senator Weber and Senator Pappas, for co-authoring this important initiative for us. Um, those four cities of the first class, I know that was a question that came up in the past. That would be Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, and Rochester, just in case you were wondering. Uh, we are, you know, you're looking at someone in myself as boots on the ground for emergency management. Um, I've been at my job for 11 years now. I've been working for about 40 plus years, but I can say this job is probably the most important job I've done in my life, and I've done private and public jobs. Um, with the boots on the ground, uh, you'll know that uh, when a disaster strikes, which happens quite often in the state of Minnesota, uh, it begins local and it ends local. Uh, the four core principles of emergency management are mitigation, preparedness, which is also planning, response, and uh, recovery. And I can tell you, I'm gonna use Norman County as an example this spring, um, the probability is high that we're gonna flood again. Just like we do every, every year, it seems like. We had one year that was a drought, but in my 11 years, I think 10 years, we flooded. So with that mitigation, now what exactly is that? That's basically what we did in Norman County is we took all those homes out of the floodway. So we mitigated those homes out so they wouldn't become a problem in the future. Uh, prepare, what do we do to prepare? We, uh, and myself, I went to all our townships, our county government and our cities and prepared them for that next bad day, whether it's a flood or a tornado, and we did drills and exercises. Uh, what's response? Response for me is once the waters recede this, this spring, which they will eventually, um, I'll go, go in and do initial damage assessments. Those assessment and the dollar numbers then get transported into the system at HSEM or Homeland Security Emergency Management. And so what's recovery for me? Well, I'm not the guy that goes out there and fixes the roads. That's the townships, that's the counties, and that's the cities or the public buildings. My job is to secure the funding for those entities and make sure it pipelines through them in a, in a fashionable manner. Problem is, it, it's not pipelining very fast through FEMA, and sometimes its state gets held up a little bit, but it's understandable. Um, there's no question that storms are intensifying um, our, and I've noticed in my 11 years that they just seem to be on a level that get higher and higher in our river banks and our streams. What happens in our area at Red River, if you know the Red River Valley, once the Red River backs up with ice jams, it backs all our tributaries up, which then backs all our um, bridges up with debris and that. So it's just really a, a tough situation. The whole, the whole reason that we wrote this bill and the reason I've been with it since the beginning in 2018 is because $15,000 from the federal government uh, in our EMPG or Emergency Management Performance Grant isn't enough to run our program. And that's supposed to run a program for me which has become a full-time job. It's really part-time money. Uh, so, you know, I'm here to, to support uh, Senate File 472 as I always have been along the line. Uh, I thank all those that have listened to us over the number of years that we've been in front of you. I recognize a lot of faces now as we come forward. And again, I thank the co-authors on this and Chair Latz and the committee members. And I think now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues that are online. Thank you, Mr. Johansson. Why don't we start with Kyle Oldry in Rock County. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Kyle Oldry. I'm the Emergency Management Director for Rock County and also its County Administrator. I'd also like to uh, thank the members for having us back again today. We've been in front of this committee a couple times and always had great, uh, great support. And we appreciate that. And a special thanks to uh, to the authors, uh, Senator Pappas and, and Senator Weber, uh, who I go back far enough with to remember him as Mayor Weber. So I, I certainly appreciate the, the continued support uh, in this in, in very uh, critical item we're bringing forward. 
as Gary mentioned, you know, there's the four the four legs of our stool uh, regarding disaster management cycle: uh, preparation, response, recovery, and mitigation. Local, state, and federal take part in response, recovery, and mitigation immediately. They're they're part of of each of those legs of the stool. Preparation has been left to local and federal. Um, as Gary mentioned, we do get an emergency management planning grant, EMPG, uh, which is required to have a local match. So local and federal take care of the preparation. What we're asking the state to do is to recognize that preparation will impact every resident of this great state. And that preparation will lead to lesser dollars in response, recovery and mitigation if we do those activities right. Um, I, I won't dwell on it. Uh, Gary did a great job. Again, just thanks Senator Weber for, for our continuing with us for all these years and getting, getting us uh, continue to move forward. And thanks members of the committees and I'll certainly stand for any questions you have. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Oldry. Uh, John Bowen from Crow Wing County. Members, we don't seem to have Mr. Bowen online joining us. So we'll move on to uh, uh, ask the room if there's anyone else who wants to come forward and testify. I don't see any. Any questions for members of the committee for any of our testifiers or the chief author on this proposal? Any discussion? Senator Weber, thank you. We will lay over Senate 472 for possible inclusion in our budget bill. Mr. Chairman, members, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Johansson. Thank you, sir. Senator Cruin, you want to take up your next one? 1760, Senate File 1760 on conciliation court claims. And uh, Mr. Blooster, if you're in the room to testify, come on forward as well. When you're ready, Senator McCroon, describe your bill. It's being handed out to the committee. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Um, thank you for giving me a hearing on this bill. Uh, this bill increases the jurisdictional limit for, uh, for conciliation court from $15,000 to $20,000. It leaves uh, claims involving a consumer credit transaction unchanged at $4,000. Um, members, conciliation court is a good avenue to resolve disputes on cases where the amount in controversy is such that paying the uh, district court filing fee and more importantly attorney's fees um, does not lead to a good resolution of a case, even if meritorious. Um, this bill increases the jurisdictional limit to account for inflation. Um, this amount was last increased uh, to $15,000 in 2015. Adjusted for inflation, that's about $18,500 in today's dollars. So I think $20,000 is a good number and will um, essentially preserve the status quo for several more years. I'd like to uh, thank my uh, co-author, Senator Liskey, and with me today to testify is Senator Liskey's constituent, Scott Pluster. Mr. Pluster, go ahead and introduce yourself and your affiliation and uh, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Lats, and members of the committee. I'm a small farmer out of uh, Scott County. I, um, my situation is I entered into a prepay agreement with a local agricultural cooperative for fertilizer purchase. After paying, the co-op changed the terms of the agreement. I did not agree to these proposed change of terms, and the co-op said they would not do business with me unless I signed. I asked for my money back. Initially, the co-op agreed to refund. Then, after a number of weeks, the co-op refused to refund. The cooperative owes me $15,890. If I bring this dispute to conciliation court, as the law currently stands, I will immediately lose $890. If I bring this dispute to district court, I will face higher filing fees and attorney fees. I'm here to testify to the change of law to keep up with inflation. Thank you, Mr. Pluster. 
Anyone else in the room care to testify on this bill? Any discussion from members of the committee? All right, not seeing any discussion. Uh, Senator Cruin, uh, this is not a uh, budget bill. I'm told it's ready to go to the floor. Make that motion, Mr. Chair. Your motion, Senator Cruin. Senator Cruin moves that Senate File 1760 be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Um. Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Kroon. Thank and you. Mr. Pluster, a safe drive back. Uh, Senator Housechild has arrived in the room, so we're going to ask Senator Kroon to uh, uh, keep track of his steps as he's uh, going back and forth from the table. Senator Housechild, come on forward. Uh, we'll take up Senate File 1591. Members, I believe you might already have this in your packets. Thank you, Chair Latz. Members of the committee are. Right, Senator Housechild, go ahead and Thank describe you so your bill for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, today I have two Senate files in front of you, Senate file 1843 and Senate file 1591. Um, given the similarities of these bills, I would like to combine them for the sake of efficiency, if that's okay with the committee. Sure, go um, ahead with your testimony on both Senate files. Great. So with that, I, so in order to do that, I have an author's amendment. Uh, thank you. We'll have uh, Senate file 1843 uh, distributed as well as the author's amendment, which is to Senate file 1843. So we will have that in front of us also. <clears throat> Give us just a moment here, Senator House Chop. Thanks. All right, Senator House Child um, proposes the A1 amendment. This is the first committee stop for Senate file 1843. Uh, Senator Westland moves adoption of the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Hauschild. Thank you, Chair Latz and members of the committee. The first portion of this bill will appropriate $3 million to the, Grand to the Grand Portage Band to purchase equipment and fund a position for the provision of Coast Guard services along the North Shore. Uh, members, most of you uh, may not know, but in 2022, the United States Coast Guard closed its station in Grand Marais. This station provided emergency services for the Upper North Shore. Since the Coast Guard left, Cook County and the Grand Portage Band have both requested reconsideration of this decision by the Coast Guard, but those requests have not been responded to. This appropriation is needed as the band is currently unable to fund an emergency management position and that impacts its ability um, and its surrounding jurisdictions to coordinate EMS services and respond to emergency situations. The nearest Coast Guard station for the entire North Shore is now in Duluth, a three hour drive away and much longer by water. More than 1,500 square miles of Lake Superior from Schrader to Ontario uh, border, to the Ontario border now lack effective and consistent rescue capacity. To adequately patrol this area of Lake Superior, two patrol and rescue vessels are needed, one stationed in Grand Marais, the other in Grand Portage. Each vessel will cost between 350 and 500,000, depending on the size uh, and its length and additional safety equipment needed for floats, to, uh, towing gear, and first aid gear. Staffing will require three seasonal FTEs in each lo location, Grand Portage and Grand Marais, for a seven month boating season starting May and ending in late November. On water patrolling will occur four days per week in each location. Total staffing would likely cost $250,000 per year. Seasonal staffing will need training and search and rescue techniques and wilderness first responding responder training. Um, this bill provides an appropriation to the Grand Portage Ban, but this project is in cooperation uh, with the Cook County Sheriff's Office. And you should have received a letter from um, the Sheriff in Cook County. The second portion of this bill provides $145,000 in fiscal year 24 and 25 to fund an emergency management position for the Grand Portage Band as well. Mr. Chair and members, I do have um, 
two, te well, one testifier here since the sheriff could not be here, and that's uh, Chairman De uh, DeSham. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman, uh, from the Grand Portage Band. Thank you. Before we go to the testimony, uh, Senator Housechild, it appears that what you've done is you've taken the language from Senate File 1591 and made that into the A1 amendment that we just put on to Senate File 1843. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so we've combined this in a Senate File 1843. Um, we just received the letter that you referred to electronically, so we don't have it distributed yet to oh. the members, but we will get it out Thank you uh, so to much. the members. Thank you. Um, and uh, our testifier, Robert Duchamp. Duchamp. Please, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm Robert Duchamp. I'm the Grand Portage Tribal Chair. Um, since the um, Coast Guard station closed last year in Grand Marais, it left a burden on Grand Portage um, trust land staff, and also the Cook County Sheriff's Department. Um, what we've seen since the COVID pandemic is people do not respect Lake Superior. Anybody here that has been on Lake Superior knows that it's its own animal. Um, we've had our staff out at Isle Royal, which is 18 miles away, and then a Todd Harbor is approximately 20 miles down the island. We've had to go out there and pull pontoon bones back. Um, we see a many 16 to 18 foot open boats go out there every weekend. Um, they just, they don't understand what Lake Superior is. I've grown up on that lake for 49 years. I've, I lived that lake. Um, what we're looking for is a joint partnership. I'm, I'm really close, I have a, relationship with the sheriff's department to purchase these boats staff them and get you know if we're, there's no coast guard staff out there people are going to start getting careless and it isn't um if we have to go rescue someone or recover somebody it's when so it uh it would be appreciated if you guys consider this bill Thank you, Chair Deschamps. Uh, any uh, questions or is there anyone else in the room that wishes to testify here? I'm not okay. seeing anyone. Any questions from members? Um, I can add on to that to the other part of that for the sure. emergency Chair management Deschamps. part of it. Um, Grand Portage has suffered like no other community during the COVID pandemic. 95% of our business comes from Ontario. Um, funding an emergency management position comes out of the revenue that our casino makes. Um, as of right now, we are approximately 30% back from nothing for a year and a half. And when Governor Walls was up, he looked at our emergency management vehicle sitting there and asked who that was. And I said, nobody. So <laughs> we kind of move forward with trying to find funding for that position because as of now we are unable to fund it so um, are you aware of uh, any other circumstances where the state is stepping in to actually fund a local or to fund a position of this nature um, on behalf of a, a different government agency than the state no Chair Lads, I, I am not familiar with, with any. Okay. That's not to say there isn't. I just yeah, I'm, no, I'm I understand. Yep. I'm just wondering a little bit about setting a precedent um, under these circumstances. I understand the financial pinch uh, that the, the tribe is facing. I'm just worried a little bit about the precedent that it might set. Um, but in any case, we're going to be laying it over for possible inclusion in our budget bill, so we can ponder that question. Um, Senator Limmer, you had your hand raised. Did you have a question? I did, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Limmer. Uh, just, just some background information. Uh, does the lower North Shore have Coast Guard services? Senator Hounschild. Um, Senator, or Chair Latz, Senator Limmer, when you say the lower North Shore, um, let's say Duluth. Up yes, midway. so Duluth would be the closest uh, Coast Guard. But do they? They don't Senator patrol Limmer. up further along the Canadian border. 
Senator um, Lachelle. Senator, thank you, Chair Latz, Senator Limmer. It's my understanding that they, um, you know, I guess I don't want to answer because I'm, I'm, I'm not certain. I would need to find that information out for sure. sure Unless sure. the chairman knows. <laughs> um, they probably do have Coast Guard service out of there. That'll run up a little bit farther out of Duluth with their auxiliary. Um, with the Coast Guard leaving, it basically left Cook County and Grand Portage with 1,500 square miles of water to patrol. And if you've been to Grand Marais, on the, along the North Shore from Schroeder to Grand Portage, Cook County is responsible for 36 miles out of that water. So there's a lot of water to patrol. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Limmer. Is there a water patrol from the county, the counties that are up in there? Um, this is. Chair sure Deschamps. <laughs> this is a joint bill with um, Cook County oh, Sheriff's I Department. See. So. Okay. And. Uh, Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Coast Guard services that are referenced in the bill, um, is there, when I'm think, when I'm reading it, it's in lowercase letters, uh, not the Coast Guard that we typically think of. So would this be more just focused on, on um, boating traffic, uh, emergency response? Uh, wouldn't be involved, in, would it be involved in border patrol or anything like that? Chairman Deschamps. Um, this would be boat patrol, you know, for rescues and whatnot. We do approximately six to eight rescues a year right now as it is. Um, we've, uh, I've got a million stories about rescues and some of them are really interesting. But anyway, from Sheriff Eliason's point, it's to patrol out of Grand Marais and then the other boat would patrol out of Grand Portage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, any other questions or, or comments from members of the committee? So really the question that we'll have to decide is number one, do we step in to fill in the money that the federal government has pulled out of this area? And then the second question, do we step in to fill in for the funding of a position which had previously been funded by uh, the tribe's own resources and which uh, finances are such now that that's exceedingly difficult. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, what are you anticipating in terms of sort of the future financial resources available for the tribe? Um, for the recovery of casino revenues or anything like that? I mean, if, if we were to step in, if we did it on a temporary basis instead of a permanent mm. kind of funding basis. Um, go ahead. Um, as of right now, we, our dependence on the Canadian customer is really the key thing. Um, in 2019, before the pandemic, there was 440,000 border crossings at our port. In 2022, there was 140,000 border crossings. So we had 300,000 people less cross up the border, which were potent potential customers for us. Right. Um, and then sure. another thing is that the Canadian dollars were 68 cents. So. <laughs> <laughs> Strike two. Well, I can assure you the legislature does not have any ability to influence the exchange rate. Um, but are, are you seeing an uptick? Um, yeah, is it's, it trending positively. It's just it's, it's taken a while to recover. Yeah, it's slowly coming back. It's just taking time. Thank you. And what other revenue sources uh, does the tribe have? The, the Mr. Deschamps. Um, as you all know, or if you if you were on the floor this morning, Indian Country is funded at thirty eight cents on the dollar from its federal obligations through our treaties. Everything that isn't funded has to be made up through gaming revenue or grants. We, <laughs> we can like, if you were in there this morning, we can stretch a dollar farther than anybody. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks for coming down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I left at four so. for the testimony. <laughs> All right, any further questions or discussion from the committee? 
So it, it sounds like, uh, well, we'll lay both Senate files 1591 and, and 1843 over for possible inclusion um, in our budget bill, and, and uh, uh, we'll just take it from there. If, if, uh, if either of them are included, we'll, we'll use the language out of what is now the amended Senate file 1843. Thank you, All right. uh, Chair Latz. Thank you, Senator House Child, and thank you, Chairman Desham, for being here. Senator Kroon, you got one more bill. Senate file 2318. If your testifiers would like to come forward too, that's fine. Whenever you're ready, Senator Kroon, tell us what your bill does. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the com committee. Um, under current law, people with uh, felony convictions who wish to change their name must go through a process uh, laid out in Minnesota Statutes 259.13, um, which is the main process. Under that process, the individuals notify the prosecuting authority who convicted them of the request to change their name, and then the prosecuting authority has 30 days to review the request and file any objections. Um, going through 259.3 works well. Um, there are reasons why the prosecuting authority uh, may object to a name change, such as a, a convicted sex offender attempting to change your name to avoid um, showing up on the registry um, and other reasons, similar reasons. Um, the other most common way for people to get their name changed is through uh, when they're getting married under uh, Minnesota Statutes 517.08. And this is where um, some of the counties are seeing some problems. When applying for a marriage license, a person with a felony conviction is directed to essentially go through the same process as 259.13 um, as part of the marriage license application. Uh, the individual is required to attest that they have sent notice to the prosecuting authority, then wait 30 days uh, to pick up their marriage license. And then after that 30 days, if there are no objections by the prosecuting authority, they can proceed with the name change through their marriage license application. Um, but there have been problems with that uh, route. Uh, there are circumstances where sometimes it takes longer than 30 days um, to process and respond to the applications, whether that's mail delivery, uh, workloads, uh, et cetera. And, and service center staff aren't made aware of this before granting the name change on the marriage license application. And also, I think more importantly, there's no way for service center staff to confirm whether or not the person actually fulfill their obligations under 259.13 um, and verify that those steps have taken place. It's, it's basically just an honor system. So that could cause the service center department staff to accept and process a name change when the requirements haven't been met. Um, this bill, Senate File 2318, would instead um, have the applicant go through the 259.13 name change process separately from the marriage license application process. Uh, the bill makes clear that the name change request must be acted upon by the court either before applying for the marriage license or after getting married. Um, I think this bill would help ensure that the prosecuting authority review process is carried out properly. And I would appreciate the uh, committee's support for this bill. Um, with me today to testify is Nang Lor, a regional service center manager for Hennepin County who can explain the need for this legislation in uh, more detail. Mr. Lohr, welcome to the committee. Go ahead and state your name and affiliation and proceed. Thank you. Uh, for, my, for the record, my name is Ning Lohr, and I manage uh, two of what you guys would refer to in this bill as a local registrar in Hennepin County. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee uh, for this opportunity to discuss uh, SF 2318. I just want to emphasize that uh, this bill is not about making it difficult for anyone to apply for a marriage license or to get married. This is really uh, hoping that we can address the gaps and concerns regarding a person uh, with a felony seeking a name change through the marriage license process. And I'm hoping that this bill will uh, address some of the confusions and some of the gaps and concerns we have. We have 87 counties with possibly 87 different ways of handling uh, felony name changes through marriage. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll kind of quickly just walk over the process with you and how we handle it in Hennepin County. As I mentioned, it, it does vary from county to county because of the complexity of uh, the current law as it reads. Um, 
When a person comes in and they make an application for a marriage license, they can do one of two things when they're attesting to the fact that they have not convicted a felon as of August 1st of 2000. They can then say, yes, they have, or no, they have not convicted a felony, or, or not a convicted felon. In that case, if they mark yes, we provide them with the instructions um, pursuant to Minnesota Statute 25913, which is, again, confusing to staff and also very confusing to applicants. Uh, during that time, the applicant must wait 30 days uh, as they uh, submit paperwork to the prosecuting authority. And the prosecuti prosecuting authority could either you know, return a response with yes, change your name, or no, or not respond at all. And that's where it becomes a problem. Um, you know, when, when individuals are applying for a marriage license, they sometimes don't realize that they have to wait 30 days um, to get approval from their prosecuting authority. And that causes them to postpone their, their wedding or make a decision about their name change at a later date. The other gap is that if there's no uh, uh, objection and the 30 day has passed, ultimately the individual seeking the name change is granted that name change through marriage. And this is problematic because in those 30 days there's uh, delays in, in, in mailing or you know, even can get lost. And in some cases, the, the individual sends it to the wrong prosecuting authority. And there's no communication back to the, to the county that this, in fact, hasn't been done. Successful completion of this process really relies on the individual who's applying uh, for that name change. Um, and really, uh, uh, honestly, fulfilling the attestation, attestation right? Because as uh, uh, Senator Kroon mentioned, this is an honorary system. Um, and there's really no way for our staff to confirm that the individual had, in fact, gone through this process. And there's also this possibility, a huge liability, where the staff can unintentionally process the name change. Again, we operate seven different offices. If communication doesn't get to the staff timely, or if the, if the individual has applied two, three months later, you know, after the fact that they've been told no, we can accidentally process that name change. And that's a huge liability risk. Um, we, we are also not experts in felony name changes. We are experts in issuing marriage licenses, and that's why we're looking for support in, in this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lohr. Julie Hansen, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Go ahead and state your name and affiliation and proceed. Thank you, Chair Latz, members of the committee. My name is Julie Hansen. I am the Property and Customer Service Manager for Scott County. I am here today to represent MACO, the Minnesota Association of County Officers. Uh, one of my areas of responsibility is vital records. I've been in this role for going on 25 years. And uh, one of the many things that is very complex is the felony name change process. So I want to thank the Senator for bringing this bill forward. This has been on MACO's platform for many years. Uh, we support this bill due to the complexity of the process. Um, some counties do see this more frequently. Uh, a county like Hennepin may see this process more often than maybe a, a smaller county outstate. Um, those that rarely see this, it is a very complex, confusing process both for the applicants and for the staff. This bill provides much needed clarity for everyone involved. I've heard a theme of simplification and um, easing confusion on many of the bills today, and uh, this bill would do the same. So thank you for the opportunity, and of course I stand for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. Anyone else in the room wish to testify in connection with this bill? Not seeing anyone come forward. Uh, any questions or comments from members of the committee? I see council is consulting with one of our testifiers, so we'll wait a moment and see if there's anything that results from that.
Senate Council, Ms. Premier. Mr. Chair, members, um, I apologize for the inconvenience. inconvenience. Um, uh, as the testifiers were speaking, um, I realized that in um, 517.08, which is the application for the marriage license statute, there is language under subdivision 1B, paragraph D, that still um, has some language about the local registrar being able to delay the granting of the marriage. Um, it, it, dis it discusses the 30-day period. And I believe the intention of, of the author and, and the parties is to not have that process in statute anymore. Um, and so the amendment would be to delete um, paragraph D of in 517.08 subdivision 1B Uh, and add that as a section to, um, to, to Senate File 2318. She's talking about well, members uh, subdivision 2 of section 517.08 is not included in the package. Amended in the original bill. So if you want to see the language, you have to open up the whole statute. Of course, you can access on your computers. I think the whole section Other has to do with 259.13. So I'm pretty good. The whole subdivision has to do with 259.13. So Ms. Prima, why don't you tell us the which provision in 517.08 subdivision 1B are you recommending to be deleted? That would be section 517.08, subdivision 1B, paragraph D, Mr. Chair, um, question Senator for Senate Senate. Council about um, whether a possible deletion of 517.8 subdivision 1A8. Senator Kroon, you're suggesting instead of or in addition to? In addition to, Mr. Chair. Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, I think that's the piece that is being amended in the bill um, at lines 2.23 to 2.28. Um, so this would, the, the piece I'm proposing would be sort of a conforming change to go with the language in the bill. Thank you. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Senator. I agree with that. Thank you. Sorry. My apologies. Senator Cruin, no need to apologize. We have an open discussion here about statutory interpretation and construction, <laughs> which only Judiciary Committee members can love. <laughs> so, Senator Cruin, you had a chance to consult with your testifiers. Do you agree with Ms. Primo's recommendation? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. The that would be uh, an appropriate amendment. That is furtherance of the what the bill seeks to do. Okay, so Senator Cruin moves that Senate File 2318 be recommending, I'm sorry, be uh, amended by adding a Section 3 that deletes Minnesota statute Section 517.08, subdivision 1B, paragraph D. Did I get that right, Ms. Primo? Is there any further discussion about Senator Cruin's motion? 
Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Is there any further discussion about Senate File 2318? Senator Cruin, I'm told this can go straight to the floor. So moved, Mr. Chair. Senator Cruin moves that Senate File 2318 as amended be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Opposed. Motion prevails. Thank, Thank you, you Senator Cruin. Um, now, we have, uh, stay there, Senator Kroon. Uh, we're going to go back to Senate file 1934. We have apparently, we're going to have that back on the table now. Uh, we've been apparently informed that the amendment that was made uh, does not cause it to uh, be held over for any fiscal, further fiscal analysis. Uh, I also understand it's not going to any other committee. Is that right? Ms. Kaplan. Okay, so it is ready to go to the floor. Uh, members, if we want to return then to Senate file 1934 uh, regarding uh, clarifications of the uh, stays of adjudication and deferred prosecution provisions. Any further discussion on 1934? Senator Cruin moves that Senate file 1934 uh, as amended be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cruin. We'll call today the Senator Cruin Day in Judiciary Committee. And that is all that we have on today's agenda, members. Um, we are uh, meeting Wednesday. We are meeting Friday. Um, and uh, we are also uh, we know there are a number of bills in the pipeline and other committees that if they pass the other committees will be re-referred to the Judiciary Committee. So we are fitting everything onto the agendas that we can that's ready to go and uh, we'll do our very best to fit on any re-referrals um, as we get them. So that means also that there may be some late minute additions to our agendas even within the three day rule just because we're at the time of session where that's the only way that we can get things uh, through the process before deadlines. There being no further business to come before the Judiciary Committee, we are adjourned. Thank you.